Now, for those keeping count, and frankly, who isn't, we are in week three of lockdown. The roads and supermarkets are definitely much quieter. Uh, Despite the glorious weather, most people seem to be sticking to the rules. But in terms of the epidemic, where... Where are we now and what do we want to happen next? Well, let's catch up with Dr Duncan Robertson, who knows about these things. He's from the Loughborough University School of Business and Economics. Duncan, morning. Oh, hi, Ben. Hi. Um, Look, good good to talk to you again. Look, um, where are we in 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 the epidemic? Where are we on the curve? Well, I think we're still in the up phase and, um, you know, many of us are sort of, as you say, wondering about what to do in this uh, glorious weather out there. And um, the problem with with this sort of uh, um, epidemic is that what we're seeing is the effects of what happened two or three weeks ago. So we're still seeing the um, number of cases uh, go up and then there's still a delay after that to the number of deaths. So we're seeing both of those going up, you know, still quite sharply. And what we're trying to do, or what the government's trying to do, what we're all trying to do, because it's in all our interests, is to get that flattened off, if you like. You know, they talk about uh, flattening the curve, and it's basically we're going up this hill. We want to get over that hill and down to the other side. Look, the, 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 I mean, uh, apart from the fact it's affecting all of us, of course, it is in, in very profound and, and fundamental ways. There's some quite interesting sort of statistical analysis, doesn't it? And it, it, what, what's the magic number of, of, of number of people infected by an infected person that we need to get below for, for it to actually start taking that curve down? Exactly, you're absolutely right. And we talked, I think, a couple of weeks ago, what we call the basic reproduction number. And that's the kind of critical number that we want to get down. You know, you want to, at the moment, I think we talked about the chessboards and doubling and doubling again. Mm. And, with, you know, what we have without doing anything is this rate of, of going up, you know, two and a half times, for, roughly, for every person, or two and a half, between two and three, of the number of people who are infected by each one of us that has the virus. So the point we're trying to do is to get that number down. You may think, well, that's just a number. But the point is that's built up of all of our individual responses, and we're trying to basically um, individually get the number down. So I'm trying to isolate with my family and not interact with anybody else. And if I don't have it, then there's a much lower chance of me passing it on. And so I'm trying to get my own uh, number down. And so if everybody does that, then we have a chance of containing this and getting over that hill. And that essentially sort of down below what one? Exactly. Yeah, that's right. So if you think about, um, you know, what you multiply that number by when you've got that calculator, if you multiply it by a number greater than one, it goes up. And if you multiply it by a 0.8, for example, it goes down. And we're trying to get that number on the right side of one, in this case, below it. I think that's really helpful, actually, to, 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 to understand that, that each of us, we've got to try and keep our, 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 in, our infectious rate below one. Seems like a really, seems like a, you know, something we can all, we can all kind of understand and relate to. That, that seems to make sense. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I was speaking to Samira, who I think was using uh, ducks last week, about ducks going down a waterfall. And that's one way of, of modelling this sort of thing, is you have equations that basically model people going from one state to another, from susceptible mm. to infectious, uh, to exposed to infectious to recovered. And the sort of response, the, the way that people are modelling now, and the Royal Society put out a, a call uh, last week, is to get people to model the individual responses, exactly as you say, and sort of modelling each of us as individuals. So rather than ducks falling down a waterfall, sort of us as Lego characters, if you like, interacting with each other and passing the virus on. And so you're absolutely right that each one of us is, you know, that character that has an effect on the entire population. So we have an individual responsibility ourselves. Look, and talk, talk me through some of the science going on behind the, behind the scenes, because I know that kind of, as it's known, operational research has got similarities to what was going on in World War II, I think, doesn't it? Well, exactly. And, um, you know, I didn't quite make this link until a, a couple of years ago when uh, somebody in the, someone in the NHS said, uh, this guy Blackett. So um, I, I did my first degree at Imperial College in London. I was sitting in this Blackett laboratory doing all sorts of quite difficult physics. And I didn't quite realise the applications of this. And people like Blackett were in the war trying to work out how do you efficiently get convoys across the Atlantic, for example, Mm -hmm. and how do you sort of get your resources um, to be optimal? And really, we've got this sort of same thing going on. We have a lot of operational researchers across the country in universities and government And what we're trying to do is to basically use the skills that we have in the sort of science of this stuff and actually apply that into policy. So a big call went out by the um, Operational Research Society. We've got, you know, tens or about 100 uh, operational researchers in, I say, in government and universities who are 
and w- which we're connecting up with the government to actually help in this response because there's, you know, a war on the virus. In order to to to, to uh, if make inputs as efficient as possible and outputs as 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 you know as effective as possible, I suppose. Exactly. It's all about you know things like optimizing things and like making you know we all have a limited resource. Uh, and we're trying to make that as efficient as possible. You know, for example, where do you test? Who do you test? Who do you vaccinate, for example? All these sort of questions are really quite interesting. And, you know, it's using this sort of um, analysis to actually make better better uh, policy. And, and look, some of that's got to play into, into what the end game of all of this is, that, that, that still, still seems a slightly sort of opaque uh, a, a mission to get to some, to some point, because as I understand it, OK, we might flatten this curve and then, you know, presumably give it a bit of, bit of, bit of headspace and, and lead time on that. And then you release the, uh, the restrictions. And then there is this risk that you get, an, uh, uh, you know, within a couple of weeks, an, uh, an enormous spike again. So how do you avoid that? Well, exactly. And I think that's what was the thinking of the government at the early stages of this. So we're trying to kind of prevent that from happening. You know, when do you actually lock down the population? If you do it too early, you might get um, people getting fed up, which, you know, kind of we all are, mm. but then sort of going out. And then I think they were quite conscious of that happening and getting this kind of second wave. And the other thing is, you know, vaccinations, trying to get a vaccine. There are so many vaccine candidates and so many universities and pharmaceutical companies working on trying to get a vaccine for this. Um, so yeah, it's you know uh, basically they're they're the ways out really. Look, I think last time we spoke, I asked you a question. You were going to you were going to go off and do a bit of research into it. So where does COVID nineteen stack up against SARS, which was, you know, in 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 some respects, we I remember at the time we were we were told that SARS was going to be was going to be appalling, and of course it was for those that it affected. In some countries, it affected really badly. It didn't, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, it didn't spread like like coronavirus has. Why? No, but I think it could have done. And I think that's yeah. some of the policies that were set into place there, for example, trying to um, trace cases, for example. I mean, the, th- the thing is, if you have a case and you know who they're speaking to and who they've spoken to and who they've interacted, you can then kind of take those people out of the population by isolating them. And, uh, you know, really it's about getting that rate below one. And that's, you know, kind of what happened with mm. SARS and with... Um, uh, you know other other viruses as well. So you know it's and one of the things is this is a very infectious virus, um, and also it's a bit sneaky because you know we um, might be passing it on to each other when we don't really know we are. So if we're going down to the park, we're you know breathing on people, not actually directly breathing on people, but we're passing it on without necessarily knowing one. That's what makes it so such a such a nasty thing. Because you have it, you have it. You're infectious, but you, as you say, you, you don't know. And is that does that feed into that? That you know, I've, I've been reading people say, well, wh- you know, why hasn't I- things like Ebola uh, spread around around the world? Is that just because it presents very quickly and, and is, is is so much more uh, dangerous to 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 life and limb? Well, one of the things I think I think this is true about Ebola. I have to check, mm. but it, you know, you've got it. Right. <laughs> And uh, one of the things about COVID-19, this coronavirus, is uh, there are lots of us going around potentially spreading it when we don't know. We might have very mild symptoms. We might just think we've got a you know, bit of a cough, but we might actually have this virus and passing it on. Whereas Ebola, you, I, I believe, uh, you know you've got it. So the problem with this is, is you don't know you've got it and you're passing it on without, without knowing it. Duncan, it's always great. I just, I love the clarity you bring to the whole thing from the science behind it all. Thank you so much for coming. Can we maybe catch up again next week? Absolutely, love to. Thank you. It's really good, and good luck with the, your uh, self isolation as well. Will do. Thanks, mate. Right. Thank you Thanks, very much. Thanks, Duncan. Thank you. There are Dr. Dun- uh, Dr. Duncan Robertson from Loughborough University School of Business and Economics.